Hello, everyone, and welcome into the Irish NFL show. It is a Hall of Fame game special, and we are delighted to welcome our first guest this evening. He's Caroline, who is from 1010XL 92.5 FM, who covers the Jacksonville Jaguars. How are you doing, Hayes? Gentlemen, I'm doing great. It's great to be with you. Well, we are uh, delighted to be chatting to you. It's actually quite uh, sunny in Dublin uh, as we record this, so we're oh, we're not good. too envious of the the Floridian <laughs> sunshine. But um, nice. For, we we ask all our guests this: Do you have any Irish heritage? Have you ever been to this little green island? I haven't, and I told my wife that uh, I was joining you guys, and she got so uh, excited because she went to Dublin and loved it said it's like one of the coolest cities she's ever been to so now uh we're gonna go at some point um and uh so i i don't have any uh uh, ancestry uh from there but i can't wait to visit hey i gotta get in to you with you on the new head coach so doug peterson has obviously taken the road in jacksonville with a point to prove after his his kind of difficult ending in philly after the turbulent year last year with urban meyer and um, what we've seen from Peterson so far, he seems to want to get involved in the community. He's been at certain speeches and rallies, you know, just to kind of get a flavor for what the people are like in the area. What's your initial thoughts of how he's taken on the role so far? He's been everything you could hope for and more. The biggest thing is that he's normal. He runs like a normal professional outfit. Like, you know, and really, to be honest, that goes back before Urban Meyer here in Jacksonville because they had Gus Bradley who came from Seattle, who's a fantastic guy, but was very much, you know, I'm not as concerned about the wins and losses. It's about getting better. And I don't want to put extra anxiety on the players. It was a very new school way of coaching. And, you know, it wasn't his fault. Gus didn't have any talent, but he went 14 and 48, got fired. And then they went to this like trio of Doug Marone and Dave Caldwell, but Tom Coughlin's running it as executive vice president of football operations. So that was unique and it worked for the first year in 2017, they were really good, uh, but it didn't have staying power. It fell apart. Uh, Then Shad Khan fired Coughlin, kept Marone and Caldwell on for one year. They went one in 15 and then Urban came in and that was obviously the biggest debacle of, of all. Uh, arguably the worst hire uh, in league history. Although at the time I I thought it would work, but I was way wrong. And, uh, you know, so it's been a while since you could probably walk into a Jaguars meeting or a Jaguars practice and what they're doing would be very normal in the other 31 outposts, whereas they really haven't been that in a while. So, uh, but Doug Peterson has been fantastic. Uh, He doesn't create these farcical competitions of, well, the rookie has to go earn it and beat the veteran and this cliche crap. It's insulting to the veteran who knows he's going to get beaten out. Uh, so it's it's been, in, in every level, it's been fantastic from how he's handled the team to how he has uh, engaged with the community. But it's great. You know, they've got Trayvon Walker, starter from day one. Devin Lloyd, starter from day one. Luke Fortner, a third round pick, starter right at center, uh, first day of training camp. So there's no illusions with Doug Peterson. And uh, he even told us today, which surprised me, that uh, he went ahead and told us that, yeah, Trevor's not going to play uh, in the Hall of Fame game against the Raiders. Travis Etienne's not going to play. He's like, some starters probably will, but those two I can tell you won't, which is refreshing. We haven't had a coach here in a long time that would you know, offer that up 48 hours before the game. We were actually in London uh, to see the Jags win on that last uh, second field goal last year. It didn't end up uh, preventing the Jags from getting the number one pick. And you mentioned him earlier, but I know that you've had the opportunity to to chat to him. Can you talk to us, I suppose, about Trayvon Walker, how how he's fitting in there? A lot of talk, obviously, in the lead up to the draft about who the Jags were going to Go, go for in the end we all kind of knew it was going to be is he everything that that you have expected down there yeah it's a funny story because I didn't like the pick you know when we started to get wind about 10 days before the draft that they were leaning towards Trayvon Walker you know I was like how you know he had nine sacks in college here you're passing on a guy like Aiden Hutchinson who you know has a sophisticated pass rush plan he has the production that you'd want 
Uh, and, and, you know, then the people, there were people, well, yeah, but look at the measurables. Okay, that's great. I get it. Traits over production, a lot of people, but there's just not that much production. Then I saw Trayvon Walker in person and because uh, I didn't go to the combine. And, uh, and to see him uh, in OTAs when, uh, you know, running around, and again, that's not contact, but just to see his frame and his speed. Uh, the first day I ever saw Trayvon, the Jaguars ran a play where the quarterback, it was like C.J. Perry, and the quarterback went to check it, thought about checking it down to the running back, and Trayvon Walker had dropped into coverage, and he closed it. 6'5", 272 pounds. He closed on this guy because he saw the quarterback's eyes go to the running back. And if he had thrown the ball to the running back and it had been a contact practice, he'd have killed the running back. That's how fast he moves. It's, he's, he's unbelievable as an athletic specimen and a uh, super polite, great young man. Can't wait to cover him. But the only player I've ever seen athletically, I started covering the Jaguars in 2013. So they've had a lot of, you know, high picks. Uh, and, and the only player I've ever seen them draft that the, from the first time I saw him, I said, that guy athletically is special. I don't know if he'll be able to play at this, but, but athletically, they don't make him like him, was Jalen Ramsey. Uh, Jalen Ramsey, when he first arrived, he was like two weeks removed from a minor knee procedure. And he was running off to the side. He wasn't working, but he was running off on, on the side field. And just watching him run two weeks removed from knee surgery, you could just tell this guy is he isn't he is beyond the normal high level NFL athlete. He is something really special. And it's the same thing I thought about Trayvon Walker. So, you know, we'll have to see if his instincts and, and everything like that uh, enable him to become a great player. But the early returns are great. He's had a couple pass breakups already uh, against Trevor when he moves when he rushes inside. Uh, he is a handful for the guards and uh, he's just so long. And he, and he, again, he's so explosive that if his instincts are just above average, you have to think that they've really found themselves a, a dynamic defender. Hey, there's one free agency signing that intrigues me is Evan Ingram as a, as a Giants fan who's had the, the ups and downs of Evan Ingram's career to date. It didn't come as a surprise that he went to Jacksonville because I felt Doug Peterson would go after players within the NFC East. He has the experience there. He knows a lot of the players there. There's been mixed reports from his from his initial few days in camp, and people tend to lose their mind very early in training camp. We have to remember it is only camp. But from what you've you've seen so far, is it a good or bad situation, with Evan Ingram? Yeah, I think you have to understand, like you said, with Evan Ingram, that that he is going to drop a ball. You know, he's not going to have the the most reliable hands. That's the that's the book on him. It's unlikely that's going to change in his sixth year. But and, and he had a couple in one practice uh, a few days ago. But he has been, on the whole, uh, he has been a very, very positive factor for this offense and something that, uh, you know, absolutely is going to be utilized. He signed a one-year prove-it deal here uh, because of Doug Peterson. I mean, I, you know, I, I think he thinks Trevor Lawrence, well, now I know, but at the time when he signed, he probably was assuming Trevor Lawrence would be good, but he didn't know that. And Trevor's first year would give you no indication of that. Uh, so he's betting on golf and he's betting on Doug Peterson. And uh, he has had some drops, but he's also caught a ton of passes. So, uh, he, you know, I know he's been to a Pro Bowl. I'm not expecting him to go to a Pro Bowl, but I do think he's going to get a high level volume of targets. And, uh, you know, and he's going to have an opportunity to, to have a big year, certainly for what the Jaguars are accustomed to at that position. I mean, he is by, he looks like a receiver. I mean, the first time I saw Evan Ingram, I said, how did he ever convince somebody he's a tight end? Because he's not even that big of a receiver. Um, and, uh, but, you know, but he, he is, he is a matchup problem because of that speed. I mean, he's obviously not a accomplished blocker, but uh, he has a chance, I think, to really have a productive year from what we've seen in camp. My guess is, there's going to be a drop or two with Evan Ingram, but there's also going to be a lot of big time plays that he's able to make. He made a dazzling catch in the end zone yesterday. So everybody and, and Doug Peterson was asked about the drops. He said, look, we're not worried about it. Uh, you know, ra rather him do it now than, than in season. So they're giving all, Evan Ingram full support. It's not like when he drops a ball, you don't see him for, you know, a, a, you know, two, two of the practice periods. I mean, they go right back to him. Trevor goes right back to him. 
and again, it was really only one day. So um, he, he's caught way more than, I mean, the, I, my guess is he, if I had to count it up in the nine practices we've had, he's probably caught 30, 40 passes and uh, 11 on 11 and, and seven on seven work. So I think he's had a good camp, but you know, with Evan Ingram, there's going to be a drop here and there. that's just who he is. It's interesting. You, you kind of touched on the fact that he, he kind of plays like a receiver because even at one stage, you know, before free agency began, there was a conversation about him potentially declaring as a wide receiver for free agency. Yeah. I mean, again, the first time I saw him, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, it, Dan Arnold is a giant compared to Evan Ingram and Dan Arnold is not the biggest tight end. I mean, forget, you know, the Jaguars blocking tight end is Chris Manhurts, who's almost looks like double Evan Ingram size. Like it, it, it really is amazing because you would never look at him and think that's a tight end. Uh, Cause again, they've had receivers that are bigger than Evan Ingram. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, I, I don't get it, but He's a tight end, and that's where they line him up. And and obviously, he's had uh, you know a, a moderate amount of success in the NFL. And I, I do think he made the right choice to come here. Uh, Dan Arnold is is a quality player, but he's not a star. So it's clear Evan Ingram is the guy. Dan Arnold's under him when it comes to that receiving tight end, and uh, and he's got a real chance to have a big year under Doug Peterson, and then either be back out on the market or reach uh, an extension with the Jaguars or even possibly they could franchise tag them. And finally, Hayes, I suppose that the long wait is is inching towards a, a conclusion in that at the time this goes out, we'll be a few hours away moving from off season to preseason. OK, we're not into the regular season, but uh, the, the first game, the Hall, the Hall of Fame game, you touched on earlier, Doug Peterson had announced earlier in the week that we wouldn't see Trevor Lawrence or Travis Etienne. But what I suppose are you looking to see from the Jags when they take the field this evening? I, I think it's just get out healthy. I mean, again, that they, these games are just the, for the Jaguars to have any chance to exceed expectations, which, you know, I would say that qualifies as anything above seven wins would be uh, a real nice accomplishment in year one for Doug Peterson. They're going to have to get to the starting line healthy. I mean, they've got better depth than what they've had, but th they can't afford to, to lose anybody of, of consequence. So I'll be interested in seeing the full list of inactives, uh, you know, when we get that 90 minutes before kick. But um, I, I, I will say this. I, they have a running back, Snoop Connor, that's going to that's certainly going to get some opportunities because James Robinson isn't going to play coming off the Achilles. He's been limited all throughout training camp, so he's definitely not going to play either. So you're down two running backs. Uh, Snoop Connor is, is a player they drafted out of Ole Miss. Uh, he's looked good. He's going to get a, a pretty good amount of work, I would think, uh, at least for a quarter, quarter and a half uh, before they turn it over to uh, the deep backups. So, uh, you know, he's somebody to keep an eye on. But uh, but I will say Travis Etienne has looked great in training camp. So it's going to be a lot of fun seeing Travis Etienne once he makes his debut, particularly once we get to the regular season. And for the Jaguars, that's September 11th at Washington. September 11th still feels like quite a bit away, Hayes, and you've talked, about the, you've talked about the positivity of, <clears throat> of the new head coach. What for you, bear in mind they've been the first pick in the draft for the past two years, what do you feel is a, a realistic season in terms of managing, I suppose, fans' expectations this side of the world who sport the, who sport the Jacks? I, I think if they were to win seven or eight games, fans would have to be pretty encouraged with that. They've won four over the last two years combined. The biggest thing is Trevor Lawrence. You've got to see growth from Trevor Lawrence and it's got to be substantial growth. I, I think everybody's willing to give him a pass on year one because his supporting cast wasn't very good and his head coach didn't know what he was doing. So he was surrounded by cluelessness, ignorance, a lack of creativity, uh, a lack of knowledge of how the league operates and and really didn't have any playmakers around him uh you know there was very little to take away out of that rookie year other than he was able to get used to the speed of the game and he got out healthy he was able to start every game um but he's looked very good he's a different player in terms of leadership command uh you can tell it's trevor's team now uh you know this time last year he was splitting reps with gardner Minshew for the first three weeks of training camp um so They've done a much better job getting Trevor ready, and he has responded well to that. So it all starts with Trevor Lawrence. If, if they win, you know, 
four games and Trevor Lawrence throws for 17 touchdowns and 15 picks, there's going to be a massive panic in Jacksonville. But if they win seven, eight, maybe nine games and Trevor Lawrence is in, you know, 31 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, uh, then I think there'll be a huge wave of enthusiasm and almost euphoria around here going into 2023. Dave, we want to thank you for taking the time to chat to us. We know that the Jags will be making their annual pilgrimage to, to London again this year, and we look forward uh, to that. If our viewers and listeners want to check out your stuff, where can they find you? Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm on Twitter at Hayes Carlion, and uh, you can find us on our website, 1010XL.com. And uh, we have apps, so we have a 1010XL app and a 92.5 FM app, so you can listen to us wherever you are. Hayes, thanks again. And if your wife and you want to come back to Dublin, we'd love to meet you here and have a couple of pints. Man, that sounds great. I look forward to it. Thank you for having me. First time ever. They're coming to the Aviva Stadium this August to face the Nebraska Cornhuskers football team in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Everybody's been waiting for that. It'll be great. We're looking forward to getting everyone over. But we are going to see a football game in Dublin. Go Wildcats! Go Big Red. Delighted to welcome our second guest to the Irish NFL show this evening. The Raiders have a large fan base on this little island. And so we are pleased to welcome from The Athletic to Sean Reid. How are you doing, sir? Pretty good, man. Thanks for having me. Have you had the the opportunity to uh, to visit this uh, little green island? No, actually, I took my first international trip in my life this past summer. I went to uh, Toronto and Vancouver, um, so I started to dip dip my toe in international waters a little bit, but not haven't haven't made it across the pond yet. Well, now that you have the passport, maybe maybe you'll be <laughs> taking it over with the with the NFL expanding uh, globally. Who who knows what the, the future might hold? Um, I I am a Broncos fan for for my sins, so I remember the the Josh McDaniels era in uh, Denver, which was an interesting <laughs> one to say the least. Interesting is a word, yeah. It's yes, word word. yes. Let's let's leave it at that. But it <laughs> seems to have um, you know gotten off to a better start. Uh, with the with the Raiders he seems to have learned some lessons he's not falling out with as many people but we did see a flash of angry uh, Josh uh, just last week can what what has I suppose you know what has camp been like with with Josh McDaniels how have you felt you know the the first couple like week and a bit has gone yeah I think when it comes to his demeanor I think it's more balanced I wasn't around obviously when he was uh, with the Broncos so I can't necessarily compared directly but it seems like he's more balanced from from people that I talked to in terms of um you know being you know a little bit more friendly you know and, and not being so authoritarian and, and you know my way or the highway both with the locker room and, and with the personnel department I think something that helped a lot with with that is um you know with the Broncos he had you know basically GM power and, and with the Raiders they actually have a GM that has personnel power and Dave Ziegler who who Josh McDaniels has known and worked worked with for a while both with the Broncos and the Patriots and so they have a trust level there and so I think that's allowed him to you know kind of ease up a little bit and just focus on the football um they still have some, some of those old school uh traits a little bit you know like I said a player got chewed out the other day if they you know, if the, the offensive line has a false start or a botch snap and they have to take a lap around the field, um, there, there's noticeably more running as punishment and also as as part of the, the practice that, that I've noticed. Um, and so, you know, there, there's still a little bit of, you know, good cop, bad cop in there with them. But um, it, it seems like, you know, from the people that I've talked to, both in the locker room and, and the executive side, that um, at least so far, you know, things are off to, to a better start than they were in Denver. Tashan, with, with the heightened expectation from last season, I mean, the Raiders went to the playoffs. They, they could have beaten the Bengals. They were, you know, they had that opportunity at the end to at least get into overtime. New GM, new head coach, as we discussed. You know, you would expect a lot of Raiders fans, and obviously they've been aggressive in free agency and the trade for Devontae Adams, that this will be a particular good season. But then you look at his division as a whole, you know, what Collins Broncos have done with the Russell Wilson trade. The Chargers have been aggressive. Where do you see the landscape of this division? I know it's early in training camp, but what's your thoughts initially going into the season for the division? 
Yeah, I think this is the best division in football. I'm pretty confident saying that. Um, as you said, the Raiders got better this offseason on paper. I would say they're, they're pretty easily a better team than they were last year. But the, the rest of the AFC West just so happened to do the same thing. Uh, I guess you could argue the Chiefs, you know, losing Tyreek Hill, but they, they made a lot of additions on the defensive side of the ball. So they may be a more complete team now, even if they aren't as dynamic offensively. Uh, you know, the Chargers, you know, they have one of the best rosters in the league, in my opinion. I think the Broncos and the Raiders are sort of in that second tier in the division. I kind of view it as Chiefs and Chargers at the top and then Broncos and Raiders kind of jockeying it out. Because I think they're going to be three playoff teams from this division. Um, I don't think we're going to see something where, where, where all four teams make it. I guess it's possible, but I don't see that happening. So there's going to be one odd man out. And I think either the Broncos or the Raiders are going to be that team. And, and it's just tough because you can be a 10 win team legitimately and miss the playoffs in this division. And so um, the Raiders may be a better team than they were last year and, and missed the pay- playoffs just off, off the strength of the division getting better. I mean, you know, not just, you know, a lot of the, the attention has gone to the quarterbacks, you know, obviously the, I think this is probably the, the best quartet of quarterback talent that we've seen in a long time in the, in the league, at least as long as far back as I can remember, but these teams, you know, their rosters are actually pretty good as well. Um, and, and so I think it's going to be primetime television pretty much every time there's a divisional matchup between one of these teams. So it, sh- it should be fun to, fun to watch throughout the season. Yeah, absolutely. I think Andy Reid gives the, the Chiefs that edge, um, you know, g- given his experience over the other head coaches, but um, should be fascinating. One of the, the things that's probably been interesting, um, and it's kind of been a source of change for the Raiders over the past couple of years, has been the offensive line. Um, mm-hmm. And it's something I think that um, I, I've seen, you know, from, from following your tweets and, and others from, from camp, it looks like there'll be some more changes on the, the Raiders line or could potentially be, um, you know, certainly at the, as we said at this point, a lot of time left, obviously, for the regular season. But it's got to be disappointing for Alex Leatherwood to be where he is at the, as we sit here recording this at the beginning of August, right? Yeah, I mean, he was, you know, just a year ago drafted to be the, the starting right tackle of the future. Um, and, and they kind of had to abandon that four games in the last season because of how, how poorly, you know, he was playing at that position. Um, I thought that toward the end of the season, I thought he was okay at, at right guard. And so my, my thinking coming into, you know, this, this off season process and, and training camp was that they would kind of flex him between the two positions and see which one that they like him best at, but he's really been locked in the right tackle since OTAs. And so it, it seems like, you know, especially after they, they drafted Dylan Parham, you know, a rookie in the third round out of Memphis, who's a, a, a guard center type, seems like they like him more at that spot than they like Leatherwood. And so if Leatherwood is going to play, it's going to have to be a right tackle. But to this point, Brandon Parker has been taking the majority of the reps since, since OTAs and, uh, I'm not, not sure how much you've watched Brandon Parker, but he's not exactly uh, seen as a top tier tackle in the league. You know, he wasn't much better than Alex Leatherwood was in his 13 starts there last season. And so I think that's really, you know, a lot of the concern, not so much that a second year offensive lineman isn't starting because that's happened before, I think, even with first round picks. But the fact that he isn't starting over somebody who we've seen not be even an average NFL offensive lineman is, is pretty concerning. And, um, you know, I mean, you, you can tell by, by the offseason moves, though, that, that this this regime didn't have, you know, they, they weren't there wasn't a mandate for them to have ties to decisions that were made by the by the previous regime. You know, even though he was a first round pick last year, he wasn't their first round pick. And so they don't have to have him in their plans just because, you know, he was a highly drafted player or, or guys that you know, we're paid a lot of money, weren't, don't have to be in their plans. We saw guys like Nick Wiakowski, Corey Littleton, Carl Nassib, who were paid a lot of money by the previous regime, get cut this offseason. Um, and, and so they kind of have free reign to kind of retool the team how they want. And at least, you know, again, like you said, you know, we have four preseason games for them, you know, uh, since they're playing in the Hall of Fame game Thursday. And there's a lot of camp left. So I'm not going to rule out that, you know, Alex Leatherwood may, may mount a comeback and end up being a starter come week one. But but right now he has an uphill fight to to get into that lineup for sure. And I suppose the other interesting one on the line is Lester Cotton, who, you know, is a guy who has been caught, I think, I think I read four times by, by the Raiders. Um, mm-hmm. And as, as we sit here today recording, he is in line to be the starting guard. Yeah, I think he has a total of five offensive snaps in his NFL career. Um, and he, uh, I was trying to remember where they came from. Um, and, and he mentioned it when he spoke to us yesterday. It was actually... Uh, in the Chargers game in week 18, I believe Alex Leatherwood got hurt late. And so in overtime, it was Lester Cotton who was filling in for him at right guard. They they they, they put together the game winning drive. So I guess he must have been doing at least all right. So I need to go back and watch that overtime period to see if if he's worth the hype so far. But yes, yeah, that's been the surprise 
I was the the biggest surprise I would say of, of this period so far. Uh, you know, a lot of it was was just because we all expected Denzel Good, you know, the veteran offensive guard, to come back, recover from a torn ACL that kept him out for most of last season, and plug back into that right guard spot. But he retired um, after a couple of training camp practices, and so I was like, oh, okay, well, this is actually an open competition, you know. And, and so Lester Cotton, you know, as you say, he's been the mainstay there at right guard. Um, Dylan Parham, that rookie that I mentioned earlier, we, we've seen him take snaps um, with the first team at right guard as well, but he's also been a left guard. He's been at center. And so it, it's hard to tell if he's really, you know, in the, in the you know, pushing for a starting role or, or is they're more so training him to be able to play multiple spots. We'll kind of see as, as training camp progresses. But as you said, Lester Cotton, he's leading the way so far. And so he's, I'm interested to see, um, you know, we still don't know, you know, how, how many starters the Raiders are going to play in the preseason or not. But I would imagine, especially with him being a young guy that hasn't played much at all in his career, that he's going to be out there at some point in the preseason. So very intrigued to see uh, how he looks. Sean, I suppose the obvious storyline is Derek Carr and his relationship with Devontae Adams. And they seem to have hooked it up already in terms of what we're seeing within camp. But one of the stories I felt that's gone unnoticed is how Devontae Adams is building a great relationship with other players such as Hunter Renfro and Waller, you know, tight end, you know, how the chemistry between all them is going to work together because essentially a brand new player coming in once he has the relationship with Carr from his college days, he needs to get to an understanding of what the other players can do on the field. Yeah, I think the, the Raiders have a kind of a unique situation where they have a, a, a very star-studded pass-catching group with, with that doesn't have a ton of ego. You know, Hunter Renfro is probably one of the most humble guys you ever meet. Darren Waller really doesn't boast too much. And Devontae Adams being as good as... He, yeah, he's confident, don't get me wrong. He firmly believes he's the best receiver um, in the league and a future Hall of Famer and all that stuff, but he's not that sort of, you know, stereotypical diva type, you know, persona that you get from from some of the, the top tier receivers over the years. And so uh, I think that's helped, you know, them all kind of build some cohesion and chemistry with one another is that none of them are, you know, upset that I have to share targets with Darren Waller or Devontae Abs or Hunter Renfro. And, um, you know, having that relationship with Derek Carr, I think, you know, has helped Devontae ingratiate himself you know, with, with his other teammates, because Derek Carr is, you know, the unquestioned leader of this team. Um, he's gotten them through some some crazy times, including pretty much all of the last season. And, and so if you're his guy, then, you know, it's hard for the guys not to respect you, along with, you know, Devontae being such an accomplished player and a two-time All-Pro and then things of that nature. And so um, they, they really mesh together really well. I think there's really no concerns about, you know, having, you know, not enough targets to go around or anything of that nature. I really think the offense is going to come down to whether or not that O line that we talked about is is bad again, which it was last year. I suppose when, when by the time this comes out, we will be hours away from the preseason kicking off. It, it's the Hall of Fame game. Um, so, some teams are <laughs> delighted to have that extra game. Uh, you know, especially with a new head coach. For others, they, uh, they're, they're, they're not too enthusiastic about it. We've seen Doug Pedersen say that, you know, we won't see Trevor Lawrence, we won't see uh, Travis Etienne. Um, I, I don't think Josh McDaniels has made any announcement as yet. For the Raiders, is it just a matter of, of getting through it with as few injuries as possible? Um, I think they'll, they'll take an, a competitive approach to it. I don't, again, I, I would foresee that like most of their starters are not going to play. Um, but I do think they want to see what their young guys have, especially with them being a new staff. They really haven't seen a lot of these guys, you know, guys holding over from the, from the previous regime. They haven't seen them in person you know, in themselves in game action. They watch film, obviously, but they'll get them, you know, their first look at a lot of these guys. And uh, they do have a, a bunch of injuries piling up. They have, you know, three projected defensive starters on the pup list right now. Trayvon Mullen, Jonathan Hankins, Bilal Nichols, um, Chandler Jones has missed a few practices. Darren Waller was a couple of practices. Um, they had a couple guys going IR this past week, Kyler Fackrell and, and Micah Kaiser. And so they've been banged up a little bit, even though we haven't started preseason games yet. So, um, but, you know, on the flip side, that's also created a lot of opportunities for young guys that are, that are unproven and haven't played that much. And those are, are the, exactly the kind of guys that, that play in the preseason because they're trying to make the roster, obviously. And so, um, you know, I think it's, you know, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think Derek Carr has taken 40 snaps or anything like that in the game, but I, I do think there's going to be some important things to watch given, you know, some of the injuries they've already sustained and some of the, the competition that they have throughout their roster and, and seeing how all that pans out. Yeah, Shannon, I read a report where there was one practice where there wasn't one legit cornerback available for practice because of all the yeah. injuries that are, are piling up. It'd be an interesting opportunity for, not just in the Hall of Fame game, kind of, but the rookies itself to kind of, I suppose, lay a marker and, and prove that they can compete in the league, albeit in preseason, and give them the opportunity to step in come, come the season. Is there any player in particular 
from the rookie class that you're excited to see? Uh, I think Dylan Parham stands out because he has the best chance to be a starter on the offensive line. Um, he's not a rookie, but Lester Cotton, just because we haven't really seen him play at all, I want to see what he looks like. Um, you know, a couple of defensive tackles that they drafted, uh, Matthew Butler and Neil Farrell. Um, as I said, they, they, they're, you know, their two starting defensive tackles or projected starters um, are on the pup list right now. And so they've really just been rotating a bunch of guys at those two d- d- defensive tackle spots. And so you would imagine that those rookies um, could have a shot to maybe try to push their way into the rotation. Um, and, and so this preseason be pretty big for them. And then um, probably the other position, the last position would be the receiver room. Um, you know, obviously all the attention is going to go to Devontae and Hunter, but they, they kind of have this four-way competition for the other outside receiver spot between Matt Collins, Keelan Cole, Demarcus Robinson, and Tyron Johnson. Uh, Matt Collins, I would say, has been leading the way with the other guys, you know, they've been impressed with and to the point where I'm starting to think they might keep, you know, six wide outs on the team, which I, I thought they might only keep five before. And so those guys, I would imagine, at least some of them are going to be playing in the preseason. And so you know, seeing who's able to separate themselves from the pack and see who's going to be starting opposite of Devontae Adams and, and kind of benefit from being on the field with some of those weapons that they have it would be something else to watch. Well, I think we've all been so starved of football that it won't matter if it's preseason. <laughs> it won't matter if it's the, the third string guys out there. We're just delighted to, to have it back. For our viewers and our um, our listeners to, to the podcast who want to hear more uh, of your stuff or, or read more of your stuff, where can they find you? Yeah, just Twitter is the best place probably to find me, Tashan Reed um, at T-A-S-H-A-N-R-E-E-D, or go on The Athletic, get a subscription, go to our writers page and, and check out stuff from me and my colleague, Vic Tafer. Well, I always enjoy the athletic stuff, and I can say that Deshaun's gift game and his photo reaction <laughs> game on Twitter are outstanding. He's definitely worth a, a follow. I want to thank you for taking the, the time to, to chat to us, and hopefully we'll uh, welcome you back on over the course of the season. Cool. Thanks for having me, y'all. First time ever. They're coming to the Aviva Stadium this August to face the Nebraska Cornhuskers football team in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. It'll be great. We're looking forward to getting everyone over. But we are going to see a football game in Dublin. Well, welcome. Go welcome. Moving red. Our third guest this evening is a beat writer covering the Jags for Big Cat Country. That is Demetrius Harvey. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing all right. How about you guys? We're, we're very well, and uh, I suppose we, we always like to, to know, I suppose, about our guests and, and whether they've been to this side of the world. And given that the Jaguars basically, you know, make the annual pilgrimage across the Atlantic, have you ever been to, to this side uh, of the world? I haven't yet. I mean, I, I hope to go one year and, you know, as long as I keep covering the Jaguars, I'm sure I will eventually um, because they have made that sort of their second home, I guess you could say, uh, at least for one game a season. Um, but no, I, I haven't been over here, you know, I've uh, or over there. I've only been uh, in the United States and then, you know, in, in Japan and a couple other countries. Uh, not, not bad. You have the passport. So hopefully you'll, you'll make it at, at some point. I, I suppose, look, we're going to get into to 2022, but we, we have to kind of go back to, to this time last year, right? And um, the Urban Meyer um, situation and, and the fact that uh, if we were talking, you know, 12 months ago, it was Gardner Minshew or Trevor Lawrence. Uh, as, as somebody who was covering the team at that time, and you had this, you know, this guy who's come out, who's talked about as the heir apparent to Andrew Luck, to Peyton Manning, to, to, to John Elway, you know, all these QBs. And, and he's going up and, and, and the head coach is saying he's got to earn it. Like, mm-hmm. what, what was that? What were things like um, in Jacksonville at that time? Oh, man. <laughs> It, you, I could go on and on about uh, last season and, and how dysfunctional it was, not only for um, us covering the team, but I mean, obviously for the team itself, but 
you know, it, it really did all start kind of when, you know, they came in, they drafted Trevor Lawrence, number one overall. He's the obvious sure, surefire, you know, starting quarterback. I don't think anybody um, would have assumed that Gardner would even have an opportunity to start. Um, so when you, when you put out that first depth chart and you see the ore and you go to the training camp and you see them splitting reps, you're, you're just confused. And, um, and, and I'll be honest, I think uh, the majority of us sort of, uh, I wouldn't say bought, bought in, but we, we kind of were like, okay, well, I mean, they're trying to make the rookie earn it. Um, in hindsight, that's incredibly I- I- ignorant to think because um, it's a guy who's coming in as probably a once in a generation type quarterback. At least that's what he was billed as. Um, so why in the world would you take reps away from him if he's going to be your starting quarterback in the future, regardless? So um, just that whole situation and then moving forward, how he and the um, staff went about their business throughout the year, mostly Urban Meyer just um, made it in, in a way, uh, it was almost as if he took what he knew in college and tried to do it in the NFL, and, and that just simply won't work. And at, at the top level, um, you're dealing with you know grown men, you're dealing with people who have families, um, they make millions of dollars. They This isn't something where they're sort of on a team and they hope to make the roster. They hope to do this. They hope to do that. No, they're already there. Um, so you're trying to build them forward to win championships, not um, grow them up. And I think that that was sort of what ended up losing uh, the majority of the players during that year. And and I think it really did all start with that, you know, Trevor Lawrence or Gardner Minshew. Demetrius, you touched on there the fact that it's, I suppose the NFL is wide ranging from young players to experienced players to players coming towards their end of their career. How important do you feel when they were looking to bring in the new head coach that it, with Doug Peterson, it wasn't just about coaching a football team on the field, essentially. It was more so about understanding the dynamic with each player because he has the experience of winning a Super Bowl and he knows how to manage players from all various ranges in terms of their ages. Absolutely. I, I think that that was sort of their number one uh, priority when they were looking for a new head coach. Now, obviously there was, you know, some rumors about Byron Leftwich, who would have been a young up and coming head coach. And um, I think that would have done well as, uh, as well. But um, when you think about what Doug Peterson was able to do in Philly to bring them their first Super Bowl, and I think it was 50 years or maybe, maybe a, a little less than that, but you know, a very long time um, it, it was staggering, you know, because he, he's a guy who can come in and sort of, reshape the roster they needed somebody to come in and 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 make sure that these guys knew that um what happened last year was in the past and what moving forward you're going to operate as a real nfl franchise because you have to remember the jaguars roster um still is but was very young when urban meyer took over they didn't really know anything else but the jaguars uh you know they can talk to their friends around the league they can talk to other coaches around the league guys that have been in the league for a long time and see that perspective. But really, you know, what, when it boils down to is they only knew that, that one part of it. So uh, to bring in a guy who's had so much success, like Doug Peterson uh, winning a Super Bowl, going to a Super Bowl and, and winning as a player, as a backup quarterback um, at the time when he was in green Bay, you know, those kind of things matter. And I think that, you know, he sort of took that job, took this job uh, with that intention of changing the culture dramatically from the, from day one, uh, he mentioned mo- multiple times, you know, this is a, a roster that needs healing. Um, it's a roster that, that, that needs to uh, move forward, move on from last year, but then also, you know, gain something uh, from this year. So it, it was something where they needed um, a, a, a brand new coach, a, a new coaching staff that not only could relate to its players, you know, they have multiple coaches on the staff that have played in the NFL um, I don't think there's a single coach, maybe there is, uh, that hasn't coached in the NFL before. Last year, they had a couple guys who hadn't coached in the NFL before. Um, first time defensive coordinator. Now they have that sort of this year too with Mike Caldwell, but he's played linebacker in the NFL for a very long time. He's coached behind guys in the NFL for a very long time. Um, so it's a little bit of a different dynamic. And I think that that's sort of what they wanted to focus on. They wanted to get player first guys. But at the same time, they wanted to have guys that have come in and with proven success. And I think that that um, matures a team significantly. We've already seen it so far during training camp. Uh, Demetrius, I've spoken to a few Eagles fans who who feel that because of the way in which his time ended in Philadelphia with that game in which he took Jalen Hurts out of the game in the fourth quarter, that 
it kind of overshadowed a lot of the great work he done throughout the years. Do you feel he, he has a he has a point as, from a selfish perspective? He has a point to prove coming back into the league to make the point that he still is a very good head coach. Absolutely, I do. I mean, it, it's not often. I mean, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not often when a uh, coach wins a Super Bowl and then gets fired just a couple years later. I, I don't think that that happens uh, very often at all. So, so absolutely, you know, he, he's a guy who who's coming in here. Um, he has a point to prove too that he can coach. He is a Super Bowl winning coach, and he has all these accolades uh, that come with it. I think that his time in Philly at the end it, it was really sour, and I think that you know he's probably had to learn a lot. That was part of why he took the the full year off. You know, he probably could have came back into the NFL as a coordinator or some other position, but you know he wanted to take a year off to make sure you know his mind was right to get better himself because you know he's not you know devoid of um of 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 cause you know he he wasn't uh perfect and then all of a sudden the eagles were bad you know he had his issues as well and i think that that's something that he wants to prove to not only himself but you know probably the rest of the league selfishly i mean he's not a guy to get up to the podium and, and talk about that sort of you know in a way where he's like oh i i need to prove to everybody that i'm still good and, and everything like that i think that he's a guy that's going to just uh, do it by by doing it you know he, he he's gonna have it written down um when the jaguars win you know in in his mind you know w- when the jaguars win games that's gonna be the proof that's in the pudding yeah i was thinking um when generally if a head coach leaves shortly after winning a super bowl it tends to be acrimonious uh i, I think jimmy johnson uh with the with the cowboys being another example which is still playing out uh now on 30 years later even even this week go to old jerry and his uh, interesting comments there but if we kind of focus maybe a little bit on the future for for the jags and, and i i'm looking forward to seeing doug wearing the visor for the entirety of the, the year not like the the winters in philly but a lot of buzz in, I've seen over the past week or so around the rookie center, uh, Luke Fortner. Can you, um, what, like, ha- have, have you been surprised? Have, have people on the ground there been surprised about, like, how good he's looked this early? Absolutely. I, I think uh, going into it when they drafted Luke in, in the third round, obviously when you're drafted that high at the top of the third round, you would assume that eventually he's going to become the starting whatever, whether that have been guard or, or, or center, you know, as he's played a lot of at Kentucky, you know, that that was sort of the, the thought process, but I don't think that anybody had him starting right away. Day one, when we were able to go out there, he was the starting center and he's never taken a snap out of that starting unit. You know, he's a guy who's come in and um, clearly has shown to the staff that he can earn this and, 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 and rightfully so. I think that um, the majority of us, you know, on the B assume that Tyler Shatley would probably um, be the starting center for now because he's had so much experience. And then, you know, Luke Fortner would maybe battle for that left guard spot for a little bit with Ben Barch, guys like that, the the other backup guard. Um, but no, Luke has come in and, and he's done really well. You can tell that he has a pretty good command of the offense. I mean, you can't really tell that too much right now because it's only, you know, so early. It's only been eight days of, of camp but you can see it in the way that they execute plays. There's not a lot of blown whistles because Luke has messed up. There's, there's been no snaps that have been on the ground um, from him, at least, you know, it, it's, it's clearly um, a sign in my opinion that, that he has what it takes to, to play at, at a high level. Um, you know, he had some struggles the other day in one-on-ones. And I think that's natural and that's going to happen for a rookie, um, a guy to come in and, and face a, six-year veteran or, or however long he's been in the NFL and, and Dewan Smoot, um, he struggled against him. You know, he he clearly was overpowered, but at the same time, you can see him sort of gaining confidence and, and, and getting better in those reps as well. So I think that all of those are good signs. Um, it's, it's, you know, we're going to wait and see uh, to see exactly how good he can be because he has big shoes to fill. Um, last year, you know, they had Brandon Linder, um, he was a nine-year veteran, I believe it was, for the Jaguars as a starting center. Um, so he's a guy who uh, was – he wasn't a Pro Bowl player, but he was very solid. Like, if if you would ask anybody in the NFL who – what kind of player Brandon Linder is, he he would have been, you know, one of the top centers in the league. And, you know, not the best, but he would have been up there. So Luke has a lot of shoes – or big shoes to fill, but um, I think he's done a pretty good job at it. 
Demetrius, one thing that never changes in the NFL is players being overpaid in free agency. And a lot of people feel that the Jags have been, have been guilty of that this year with Christian Cork and the, the big contract. Um, from what you've seen initially, I'll be in camp. Are you, are you impressed with what you're seeing? And, and how is he kind of fitting into this new offensive scheme that, that's been yeah. built around? Um, yeah, Trevor it, it, it's, it, it's still early um, for Christian Kirk. And, and, and you can kind of see the differences in terms of, you know, a guy that's coming in new and Trevor Lawrence, that connection between them, the chemistry that they still need to build. You can see that there are a little bit of issues there. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Um, it just means that, you know, it's going to take some time to really gel um, Christian into the offense with Trevor. I think that's really important to note um, because, you know, Trevor Lawrence has been, you know, on fire, in my opinion, in, in, in some aspects, throwing to guys like Marvin Jones or um, or a Treadwell, you know, the guys that he, he already knows. But from what we've seen from Christian, you know, he's going to be a guy who's going to play in the slot primarily uh, in, in the three wide receiver uh, sets and two wide receiver sets. He's going to be playing outside, obviously. Um, they're going to move him into the backfield. They're going to motion him all around. seems like he's going to be a, a heavy part of this offense, and as you should expect um, after paying him so much money. You know, uh, obviously he's a guy that came in uh, with a lot to prove. He hasn't ever had a 1,000-yard receiving season. Um, but there's been a couple catches out there now, you know, over the past few days that have caught my eye. There was one in the back of the end zone that Trevor, you know, it was honestly a, a beautiful throw that, that he made, but a, a great catch as well. And, you know, those are the type of plays that you would expect out of a guy who's coming in as a high price free agent. And you would expect him to, you know, continue forward with that. Um, but yeah, m moving forward, I, I feel like Christian, um, I'm not sure how good he's going to be. You know, I, I wasn't necessarily incredibly high on him um, in the free agency market just because he hadn't proved uh, to be that high level receiver yet. Um, but I do think that the Jaguars and Doug Peterson are going to figure out a way to get him incredibly involved. And I do know he has plenty of talent. So obviously we're recording this, you know, at the beginning of um, preseason. But if we were to jump ahead, um, you know, to the Jags' first game of the regular season, it's going to be an interesting one because the, the Jags with nothing really to play for at the end of last year de facto ended Carson Wentz's time in Indy. Uh, we all saw Jim Irsay's, uh video uh, in, in front of the, the private jet. Maybe we couldn't hear what he was saying, um, but we, we saw and, and we, we saw the end results. The, the Jags now face the commanders on the opening day. Um, are they, are they going to look to, to rain on Carson's parade again? Absolutely. I mean, I think the players will for sure. I mean, the, it, it was a, it was their crown jewel, you know, moment of last season. You know, they only won three games, but to win, to cap it off, um, with the victory, a dominant victory, in my opinion, over the the Colts and Carson Wentz, especially, um, you know, that 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 sort of stays with you. I think guys like Chad Griffin, um, guys that were already on the team still on defense there, they know what they're going up against. They know that they understand how Chris or how Carson Wentz um, works, you know, so I, I absolutely do think that they're going to go in there with a the fire. Um, I think that they're going to, you know, be able to at least limit him because there are plenty of plenty of limitations to Carson Wentz's game. And I think that they sort of had his number last year. You know, I, I'm not sure exactly how the new scheme is going to fit into that and things of that nature. But, yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, Carson Wentz week one, they're circling it saying we already got this guy. Demetrius, uh, first round pick. So first pick in the draft, Trayvon Walker to then move back into the first round again to go defense. They've retooled in a lot of positions on defense. Do you feel that the the identity of this team this year would be more defense than, than offense? Albeit the Trevor Lawrence, you know, experience should be really good. It's more geared towards a, a, a very strong defense. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the things that caught everybody's eyes during the draft and during the offseason, during free agency and, and things like that, where um, everyone kind of expected them to go heavy on, on offense and they sort of went the other direction, you know, but aside from Christian Kirk, Evan Ingram, they went all in on defense, you know, Foye Oluwakin, you know, the, the linebacker from the Falcons, Foley Fadakasi, the defense tackle from the New York Jets, you know, they, they, they went all in uh, Darius Williams, the, the, the nickel. And then obviously the first two picks of the draft defense, uh, if, 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 if there's anything else from this uh, year that is, that's made me understand the Jaguars more is that they are going to be a 
Um, very defensive minded team to start, in my opinion. Uh, they, they they have drafted defense for multiple years in a row. Um, they have signed plenty of players multiple years in a row. So I, I think that um, if there's any unit that's going to be good, it will be the 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 team's defense just because of how much they've invested, you know, the millions of dollars they've invested, the draft picks, um, all of that. I think that they're just a step ahead of the offense, which still needs a little bit of work. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to find their, their niche, so to speak, you know, trying to find out where they sort of fit in and, and, you know, obviously second year quarterback, uh, that's a, that's an issue where, um, he's still young, you know, it, 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 I know that everybody believes that Trevor Lawrence is going to be this great quarterback, but you know, he's, he's still young. So it, you might not see that right away, but I do think one thing you can see right away is a more dominant defense just because of the uh, sheer number of veterans and proven veterans that they have on the team. We have really in, enjoyed chatting to you. And with this going out, we are going to be mere hours from um, the the start of preseason and uh, what we hope will be a fantastic 2022 season. For our viewers and listeners who want to find you know more of your, your stuff, where can they get that? Well, they can go on ahead and go to uh, bigcatcountry.com or just you know go on my Twitter handle um, at Demetrius82 on Twitter. You know That's pretty much where I stay. I, I pretty much live on Twitter. So everybody can just find me there. Well, we want to thank you again for taking the time and hopefully we can welcome you back on over the, the course of the regular season. Absolutely. I appreciate it.